Welcome to another edition of the Corner Booth Podcast here from the Stoughton Deli. I'm Aaron Rand along with Bill Brownstein of the Montreal Gazette. And our guest today, Montreal Radio veteran Ken Connors. Ken, thanks for being here. Hey, thank you, Aaron. Thanks for being here. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, uh, Ken, after a mere 40 years in the business, you've decided to what to call it quits. A startling decision given the fact that you're so young <laughs> and still so limber. And a good voice. So, first of all... Uh, Ticking all the boxes. I, I know I asked you this when you actually announced a couple of weeks ago, yeah. but... For people who have been in this city for some time, uh, obviously your most recent stop is at CJD, but being, we're both radio guys. I, I think you probably worked at every radio station in the city on and off over the years. Am I close? Close enough. Close enough. There was a while, though, I think when we were uh, at Place Bonaventure, uh, we were working for different radio stations, but uh, we were with the same owners, right? For a while, I think Chorus owned uh, yeah. Q92, and then they sold it to Kojiko, yeah. and so that was that whole 940, Q92 for one year, then it became the Beat. Uh, 92.5. But yeah, it's kind of like, uh, I always compared it to being a coach in the NHL, you know, after a while, uh, you know, the team gets tired of you and you move on. And off you go to another team. Exactly. You know? yeah. And yet, you left on your own accord. This is an unusual thing in the media business <laughs> these days. A radio person leaving a job because they wanted to. Why, Ken? Why could you do that? To, how could you do that to us? I started thinking well, about it. sounds really upset, by the way. <laughs> I asked that question. Well, I worked, with Ken. I worked with Ken for yeah. eight years on weekends, so, I mean, I know him well, and I've partied with him, I've gone out with him, and all the rest. I don't so think now, you need this sort of details, but <laughs> And, I mean, you know, he didn't give me a ring, but, uh, you know, apart from that, no, it was a tremendous, tremendous experience. And, uh, Thank you, Bill. And Ken left at the top of his game as well. Like, I mean, number-wise, uh, according to one source, you had the highest number of uh, Anglo listeners of anywhere in North America. Of course, we have to consider the source, but... Yeah. <laughs> not, Who is your source on this? Did, say did Ken you? say that? Who, who said no, that? It was actually Rob Braid. Oh, that's right. did, yeah. And he, he did say that, but... Which is a remarkable achievement. Yeah, just popped a Sudafed, though. He was battling a cold. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure how accurate those are. But uh, let me just sneak this in about Bill Brownstein. Uh, Bill and I had a great working relationship for eight years, despite the fact that at another radio station where I hosted a thousand movie premieres, and he was at every one of them, he used to heckle me to start the movie. Uh, you to you like that? <laughs> it doesn't have much patience. <laughs> start the movie. Uh, can we... Let's go through this historically. So... Yeah. Um, How'd you get to Montreal? Where did you work? Let's go through that. Born and raised in Ville Saint Laurent. Thank you for asking, Aaron. Born and raised in Ville Saint Laurent, and uh, started at three uh, small market radio stations in Ontario, as some of us are want to do, pay our dues. And then I was working in uh, the winter of '89. I was working at a rock station in Ottawa. I was slowly trying to make my way back to Montreal, and I got to, I got to Ottawa, and uh, I was there for a couple of months, and then uh, Shom called and offered me. Uh, they knew I was a Montrealer, and. Uh, uh, was uh, trying to get home, and so they offered me the All Night Show in the summer of '89. So back in those days, were you sending audition tapes out, like on cassettes, so oh, trying yeah. to find? That's what you were doing. Oh yeah, my first radio job after uh, sending out 25 demos, uh, I got one. I got 24 rejection letters. You know, wow. dear Mr. Connors, thank you so much for your tape. They took At the, the time moment to send we had no rejection <laughs> letters. That was very thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, actually, they did write back in the day. And then uh, one station in Northern Ontario, Kirkland Lake, offered me the All Night Show. Because two uh, former Montrealers were working up there, believe it or not. And oh. So, yeah. So, um, and so I started there, yeah. But yeah, demo tapes, demo tapes. And uh, I got the job in Ottawa because a kid I went to uh, school with in Ontario uh, was doing the swing show there. And he says, I'm leaving. They're going to look for someone to fill in as a swing. And I was at Guelph at the time and doing the afternoon show. And so, uh, yeah, I grabbed, uh, I grabbed his shift and I grabbed his apartment. It all worked out. <laughs> nice that. And it took you, wait, so you're saying three years from the time you started working uh, in Northern Ontario to get yeah. to Ottawa? Four years, yeah. Four years. Four years yeah. So I start, yeah, started in 84 and I uh, got to Ottawa, sorry, five years. I got to Ottawa on uh, 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 Christmas of 89. And you worked there for how, you said three months? Three or four months, yeah. And boom, Shom comes along. Yeah, Shom comes along. Wow. And then, uh, so I did the All Night Show for about a year uh, or half a year. And then in the summer of 90, uh, they bumped me up to the Electric Lunch Hour. And I was off and running. Who'd been doing it up until then? You remember? Al Gravel. Al Gravel. Al Gravel. Yeah, Al Gravel. I remember that. Al Gravel was, uh, when I got there in 89, Al Gravel, Terry and Ted in the morning with, uh, I think, Cindy Aikman before Patty came back. And then uh, Al was doing the midday show and Chris Michaels. Remember sure. Chris Michaels was yeah. doing the afternoon show. So 40 years, you must be going through withdrawal right now. It's been how five days and you haven't <laughs> touched a microphone. Uh, as, as we tape this, uh, this uh, we're, it's the day before my first weekend without having to get up on Saturday At morning. At 2 in the morning. Yeah, so. 
you know, n- I think call and check on me. It's yeah. tomorrow morning at some point. Get, get Bill to do that. <laughs> but you know what people don't realize? Unlike the the lazy people, like in most of radio, well, not in public radio. Oh, sorry, what? I'm sorry, I was just joking there. No, oh, not a decide to you. But uh, I, I, Ken like would get up at two o'clock in the morning to do like if Saturday Night Live were on or something like that, and we would going to be talking about it the next morning. He would get up fairly early to get clips from the shows. He was getting clips all the time. It was two days and filling in for Andrew Carter, but for the most part, he was working all the time. And you know how the radio business goes on the private side where you yourself do a lot of production and uh, so do Ken. And it's it's a really tough job. So people don't understand. Like, I mean, you were getting up pretty much in the middle of the night for most of your adult life, and it's tough. Yeah, it uh, wears on you after a while, but... Uh uh, yeah, because you know what? I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to prep. You know, instead of hanging off to someone, I tend to do it myself. I, you know, you, yeah. you make clips, you want them to sound right and sound the way you hear them in your head, so you end up doing them yourself, like music clips and clips from TV shows that we'd use on the entertainment chat. So, yeah, we'd get up. Uh, uh, I should have called you some of those mornings when it was 4 30 in the morning <laughs> yeah, and I was sitting yeah, at the kitchen right. table. Bill, uh, what would you like from uh, last night's <laughs> SNL? Yeah. If I can go back, so I remember, um, so when you went to work at Shum, you are working on Green Avenue at the time. Yeah, yeah. In the old building or in the new building? In the, yeah, 1310. Uh, not 1355. No, next so to the old never post office. office. Right, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. So, and I remember I worked in that building as well for a while. How has this, so 40 years is a long time in any business. If you were to look at this in retrospect, how has the business changed from when you came to Montreal and started working at Shum then? to what it's become and what it's been up until you left. Back then, it was all just it just seems a lot more personal. Uh, you know, we were owned by a, a family-run business. Yeah. Uh, I guess back at the time, I guess it was Standard Broadcasting, if I'm not mistaken, in the Slate. Slate, Slate. Slate. Yeah. yeah. I think Jeff Sterling might have owned Shum even back then. Oh, you're, you're probably right. Yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah. then it became Standard. It's just a little more impersonal right now because yeah. there's, as you know, in this telecommunications business and uh, radio and TV, you're just, you're, uh, there's only two or three big players, right? And we're owned by one of them. And so it's... Uh, it's really changed. Uh, you know, I always I, I talk to Terry DeMonte uh, on a regular basis and uh, other people in the business, Pete Mario, Joe Spy, every Saturday and Sunday morning to chat with me because he works down the hall at Shome on the weekends. And uh, we're kind of lucky and we feel fortunate. I imagine you feel the same way that you sort of worked at almost like the golden era of radio, you know, yeah. the 80s and the 90s. It was. It was just a little different back then. I know I, I'm I'm thankful that I got a chance to you know uh, work when we still play use turntables in the studio and. And the technology was a little different. I still have nightmares about trying to edit on a reel-to-reel machine in the studio. <laughs> ah, those days. <laughs> With that white pencil and the, uh, and the, the razor, splicing tape, splicing yeah. tape and the razor blade. <laughs> As a kid, was this something that you always dreamed about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, my, my, uh, I'm the youngest of six, and uh, my sisters uh, would would tell you that. Uh, you know what I used to do? I'm almost. Are we are we rolling on this? Uh, are, no. <laughs> When I was a kid, and I'm dating myself here, I used to have one of those little uh, cassette players with a little microphone, and right. I would tape the musical performance off the Partridge Family TV show. <laughs> I'd hold the microphone up to the speaker on the television, and I would tape and I would play them back. And I would collect all the uh, musical performances. Plus, uh, I, my mother was pretty strict about making sure I went to bed as a kid, but she would always let me either read or listen to the radio. And so I either uh, listened to uh, Dave Van Horn do the Expos broadcast, or, uh, or Dick Irvin, uh, who was, uh, always did the radio uh, Play by play on the CFCF, I guess. Back, you know, it's really funny because obviously, when I hear you describe this and what you did, I think back to what I did. Or it's the same idea, right? Yeah. Trying to do play by play of a hockey game while it was on TV, <laughs> you'd be holding a mic and doing that. And I think for a lot of people in the business, at least back then, I think that's probably how a lot of people got started yeah. in this business. So yeah. it was for you, it was for me. And when I ask you how different it was from then to now, you described you described it well. But I wonder to myself if electricity, excitement, whatever, it seemed different back then. First of all, there were, there were more people around. You'd walk into oh. the station, there was the copy people, the traffic people, you know, the on-air people, the administration. And now, I mean, certainly in, in our building, it's just, it's the on-air guys and a, a producer or two, and that's it. It doesn't seem the same now yeah, as were, it did then. There was always commotion in yeah. the newsroom, and yeah. I miss that. There was people, yeah, absolutely, there were people running around and trying to get something on the air. and. Now it's so quiet. It's like uh, it's a totally different vibe when you go in. Yeah. It was a real adjustment, especially, especially when, on weekends. On weekends, especially when the, the pandemic changed everything, of course, right? Uh, in terms of how many people were in the building. But I kind of miss that. One of the things I noticed when we got to see when I got to CJD is that where you worked, they didn't have the station on. 
like in the, you know where you could hear it in the building. In yeah. the building, yeah, in the, on the on the floor. They have television on. Yeah, they had television on. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it certainly changed, and uh, I'm just fortunate that uh, I got a chance to work during a really good time. But I figured 40 years was a good uh, number 40 to go years out good. on. And, but uh, there are no radio schools per se. Did you go to uh, like? Did you study announcing? I don't know. You? I have a story. So I wonder what it was for you. There was a. I don't know if they're still around. I guess they aren't. A place called Career Academy. Right. I right. And I, rem I remember, so I'm a kid, I'm 17, maybe 18, and I'd apply to go, and they, they'd sent a guy to your house <laughs> in, in a suit. <laughs> Real? Yeah, and he would give you like a test, right? Because you had to qualify. You had to, all you needed was a check, but they wanted to make it seem like you need to show some kind of proficiency. And he would have you read something, and one of the words was zoology, which is spelled Z-O-O. And my parents were sitting at the table, and I was there taking this test to see if I could get into this you know, school. Oh, my God. And I read zoology, and I swear to you, this is not a lie. The guy kind of made a face, and he went, say it again. And I said, zoology. And he went, I'm afraid it's zoology. <laughs> which, which gave me an idea right then and there that perhaps uh, this was not the best option for me. And my parents actually told me, don't argue with him. He's from the school. <laughs> and I ended up not going to that place. Blew it. What was it for you? Yeah. Do you remember? Uh, I'm just so impressed the guy came to your house. Yeah. <laughs> it's like an insurance salesman. That's what he kind of seemed like. He's also the milkman. Suit and tie and everything else. <laughs> Career and milk. Um, I wanted to get, I realized I wanted to get into radio when I was a teenager and I didn't know how. And there were, I think the only option at the time was Concordia had a radio and TV program. But I think okay. two years of the three year program was television. And so I said, no, it's not for me. I wanted right. to get into radio. And then Dave Boxer. Do you remember Dave Boxer? Yes, I do. With a, what was that? A Nortonizer. 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 Legendary yeah. top yeah, 40 yeah. radio announcer yeah. in Montreal. And he had a radio school that he operated uh, somewhere. Uh, I can't remember where it was. And uh, so I signed up for it. I put my deposit down. And I think two weeks before it started, something happened and he had to cancel. Oh, and okay. I was devastated. Did you get your check back? I think so. I think I got my deposit back. <laughs> I was just devastated. What am I going to do now? Anyways, so. Um, so I, Northern Ontario was your school? <laughs> no, actually, uh, I thank, I credit my wife for this. I said, I, I got to find a way to get behind a microphone and get some experience. And uh, uh, she had just started McGill. And she says, why don't you go to the, uh, try it, the McGill radio station? And I said, I don't go to McGill. She says, it doesn't matter. Don't tell them. Don't tell them you don't go to McGill. <laughs> and so I walked in and I had a whole backstory about what classes I was taking, what, what my professors were. <laughs> and they gave me a Tuesday night show. Uh, for a year. Well, this is downstairs in the studio. Radio, Radio McGill. Radio McGill. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday night, six to eight. And so, so I'm a fraud. A little bit. <laughs> you do what you have to do. Remember that great story about Leno listening in on the conversations about who's going to get the Tonight Show? You do what you have to do. Yeah. Uh, what did Leno do? I think he uh, there was a hot, there was a, a meeting at NBC to see who was going to take over from Johnny Carson and Le Leno him or Letterman, right? Yeah, him yeah. or Letterman. And so Leno went into the closet in the next room and put a glass up against okay. the wall to find out what they were saying about him. Anyway, so all this to say, you do what you have to do, Bill. To get I, in. Yeah, yeah. I, I see. That's to me again. What? So what year would that have been when you're doing Radio McGill? Uh, Radio McGill would have been uh, 1981. Okay. So I've been there a few years before. I used yeah. to. They let me do a. Sh they let you do a show <laughs> with no experience. Yeah. And let you I pick your own to, music too. Well, okay. So yeah. you picked your own music. Yeah. I would run. Did you do this? I would run contests because I knew nobody was listening. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'd give away cars, homes. It didn't matter what it was because nobody listened. It was on closed circuit in the dorms. That's right. And nowhere else. I know. You didn't do anything crazy like that? No, just spun the tunes. and. Uh, it's amazing you mad you managed to find yourself in the real world of radio then. Yeah, and so anyways, from that I, I made a demo tape, and uh, I've told the story many times before, but uh, I used to love listening to FM 96 at night. And uh, they had a lot of great announcers, and Richard Burrell at the time was doing sure. an evening show. And I called him, he answered the request line, and I said, I told him my story, I said, I'm, I'm, I have this show at Meridian McGill, I want to know if should I could pursue this or not. And uh, he said, why don't you come on down tomorrow night? And so he was good enough to bring me into the studio over on Fort Street. And uh, after he got off at midnight or 11 o'clock, whatever, uh, we went into a production studio and he listened to the tape. And all he had to say was, I hear some potential. And that was all I needed. You know, you just need that little, that little bit of encouragement. And uh, so I, I, uh, I sent tapes out to um, 25 stations in, uh, in Ontario, small markets. Chatham said no. <laughs> Aurelia said no thanks. Chatham's lost. But Peterborough was all full up. The Corner Booth Podcast is brought to you in part by the Snowden Delicatessen, where we are. 75 years in business, the home of Montreal's greatest smoked meat, plus Carnotzel, potato latkes, and the famous Snowden Deli party sandwiches. That's the Snowden Delicatessen. 
What's incredible about both of you, in fact, because you both come from music station backgrounds and you both uh, transformed into talk radio. And not the easiest thing in the world to do. Yeah. Uh, Aaron, did you did the same thing. Your whole background was music and you, you love music as Aaron did too. And then suddenly you're talking a lot and it, it, that had to be a huge transformation for you. Uh, yeah, it was. It was a little tough because uh, I kept looking to play music <laughs> to kill some time, yeah. <laughs> but you can't. And Aaron, Aaron made the transition so beautifully. I mean, he's, he's, he's one yeah, of the no, best no. at it right now. Uh, but yeah, I always tease the guys now in music radio who you know say they have, a, they have a busy show and they're a little tired. So yeah, go back and play nine in a row really. and see how you know. But it's the league work involved. It's a, you know pop culture, politics, medicine. I mean, you cover the gamut, food and everything else. You really have to immerse yourself into city life and into a whole other world. You just have to. You don't have to be an expert on anything, but you just have to know a little something about a lot of different things. I think to uh, to get by. I don't know how you feel about that. It's exactly the same. Yeah. You can't possibly be an expert no. on on everything. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and then relying on people like when you have Bill on to talk about entertainment, whatever, and just kind of expound on it that yeah. way. For the but expert. I'm curious, you know. So that transition to Bill's point from music, you know, back sell a record, do 90 seconds, go into another piece of music. When you started doing talk and started doing this show. Were you panicked at the beginning? Oh, yeah. I was really nervous. I was nervous because it was talk radio. And B, um, I was feeling, I was t taking over for Dave Fisher. And he had a Side. big, strong, yeah. loyal audience. And um, I remember when Dave did his final show and they invited me, of course, to uh, sort of take the handoff from him. It was downstairs at the, uh, the radio station at Bell Media. And uh, some of those, uh, a lot, they invited some of his listeners too, about, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them. And most of them were glaring at me, Bill. Yeah, they <laughs> threw things at you, I think, right? Yeah. Did I, I throw a bagel at you? <laughs> <laughs> no, so it was, it was a little intimidating. But uh, when Terry called uh, last week to wish me well on the air, I, uh, I remember he called me and gave me a big pep talk. I had accepted the job. And I was uh, I was sitting in the food court at Plaza Marie, and uh, he gave me a good pep talk because he had he had to replace uh, Balkan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and so um, that you know we could take a little trip down memory lane for people watching who remember who've lived here for a while and remember people in radio who've come and gone. You work with some of them, yeah, uh, over the years. Mm -hmm. So if you go back, you said you worked with Terry. Well, you worked at Show when Terry and Ted were doing the morning show. Terry and Ted, yeah, uh, Cindy and Patty, and uh, of course Tutal. Tutal uh, was a legend yeah, at Show and. Was great. Um, uh, Claude Rajat, uh, at the time in '89, he had a show on Monday nights. I think it was New Music, and um, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name. Uh, it'll come to me. But uh, another one of our French broadcasters, uh, Denis Grandin. Denis Grandin, he was sure. a terrific big music fan, and so a lot of them passed through the doors there at the show with him. Uh, you still listen to show now sometimes? Uh, every now and then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Different. It's a little different, uh, you know, not to talk too inside, but they've reduced their music library, yeah. and so, uh, which is unfortunate. But uh, yeah, every now and then I listen in to see uh, what they're doing, what they're playing. So uh, I, this is interesting too to me because you, I think you started hinting at this a couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh, I'm thinking of retiring. I'm going to retire. My wife and I, because she'd retired before you, and, and I guess the talk had been, you know, Ken, we can be doing this together. So it took you a while to get to the point where you're saying, okay, I'm going to do it. So what was the issue? What took you so long to make that decision? Um, I was afraid how much I'd miss it, and I was going to leave too soon. And uh, I, so I thought about it a lot during the pandemic, and uh, it's one thing to think about it, but when you finally have to go in and tell your boss and say the words out loud and see how it reacts, <laughs> you get a bit of a knot in your stomach and you say, am I making the right decision? But I, I, I gave myself enough time. I started thinking about it, I think, in 21 or uh, maybe early 22. And I decided, okay, I'll tell them in 23. And so I gave myself a lot of time, and I thought about it, and I talked a lot about it with my wife and a couple of close friends, and uh, bounced it off them. And, and yet you decided to quit at the end of 23, and they kept they, they kept on holding you. And they, they, to take Please the, don't go. Please yeah. don't go. And like, it's, uh, like three months later, uh, you know, the, finally, it's enough. Yeah. But uh, but you will be filling in for for Andrew Carter when he's on vacations. Yeah, so. that's my uh, that was the agreement we came to just to ease the ease the pain of uh, <coughs> of uh, leaving and missing it. So uh, we agreed that uh, for the remainder of the year, when Andrew went on holiday, I'd, I'd fill in. So just to slide into it a little more gracefully. I want to ask sort of a sort of a bigger question in terms of radio in general. It's funny. Yeah. I, I think back 15 or 20 years ago, 
Um, I remember the big fear in the business at the time was satellite radio. Oh, yeah. It was going to demise kill, of radio. Yeah, 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 yeah. going to yeah. kill terrestrial radio. Yeah. We're all done. Terrible business. Back your back. That never happened. But no. then again, back then, no one saw streaming on the horizon at all. And here we are now. And that's really the big issue. So radio has changed an awful lot. I wonder what you think about the future. Uh, <clears throat> you know, um, there's a lot of competition out there. And there's a lot of choices. What uh, sort of... Uh, um, calms me when it comes to the future of radio is the fact that there's examples every now and then where a uh, local, good local community radio plays a part. And uh, we talked about this last week uh, on my final day that uh, the ice storm last April, I think it was a year ago this week. Yeah, yeah, um, it was. Uh, and uh, we jumped in and we were, uh, we were on around the clock really just uh, being there for people and letting them call in and uh, giving them all kinds of information. And uh, it, uh, it really sort of um, reminds you of the power of good local community radio. And I think that's a great service that CJD, a station like CJD still yeah. provides. And so you know, but that said, you have, ex because of technology, expats, like you have people listening in Greece, yeah, in yeah. like uh, yeah. the Antarctic, everywhere because, because of the technology can pick it up. I've been away to Europe and uh, been able to pick up and just wanted to hear yeah. what was happening. It, it's unbelievable. And it really, the community, the global community has really been brought together. And again, nobody could have foreseen this. Those days when everybody said that AM radio was dying or radio was dying in general. It's, Quite the contrary, as that's, your numbers would attest. That's the wonderful thing about uh, uh, the charm and the magic of CJAD. I mean, it's so ingrained in so many families and so many lives that people just use the iHeartRadio app if you want to get yeah. a plug-in. <laughs> the iHeartRadio app. Just to stay You're connected. not working anymore. It's not necessary. You don't have to read the promo sheet anymore. It's okay. I got one in. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's uh, we get so many calls, uh, especially during the trivia show on Sunday mornings, for people who just want to stay connected to the city, and they're yeah. you know they're living in California, they're in Arizona. We get text messages as, as you do as well. You know, I'm listening in from the Bahamas or I'm yeah. in Greece, and so it's, uh, it's you know, and it's, it's interesting too if you just flip that nowadays because of to Bill's point because of technology. Think of yourself: you could decide to move to I don't know uh, to Greece tomorrow, or go live on a beach somewhere. And still thanks to it. what we can do, yeah. Yeah. still do a radio show from there. You have access to all the same information there. To me, that's one of the biggest changes in the business. Back in the day, pre-internet, if you will, and it's only 20-some-odd years ago, you'd walk in to do a show, and if you did prep, you'd have a newspaper or two. You'd be able to go through the newspaper, what happened the day before. That was your prep. Now, it's limitless. You could, I mean, you spend hours a day going through every news source you possibly can and trying to find that kind of stuff. So literally, you could do that from anywhere. You don't have to be in Montreal, you could do a show sitting on a beach in, in Cancun if you wanted to. So that's, of course, what you're You can still do it. Right? Right? <laughs> Let me it, make a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, we know of some people who actually have been doing shows like from here, yeah. and haven't been living here, yeah. and sometimes have been as far away as Mexico. Yeah. Let uh, me pick up two points uh, that Aaron mentioned. Uh, one, A, there is... That's the radio. We wanted just inject some in to give people an idea of what we were talking about. There's so much. I don't know if you're like me, but I, I, I spend so much of my time prepping my show just sitting sitting down somewhere at home with my phone in my hand. And, you, you know, you have so much information right there in the palm of your hand and sources and emails. And you can get it all done on your telephone. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, the access to information now instead of, you know... I used to go. I used to go to the multi mags. Sure. Yeah. And buy you know the yeah. New York Times and the USA Magazine. Today. Yeah. Yeah. Magazines yeah. and buy Time and buy Newsweek and uh, do all that. But the other thing I wanted to mention about doing the show from anywhere. One of my favorite stories and something that really impressed my wife and a light bulb went off in her head when it happened. I had a chance to interview. Uh, maybe just pre-pandemic, maybe it was 2018, 2019, uh, David Crosby from Crosby, Stills sure. National Young. I think he was coming to Montreal for a show and had a new album out. Uh, so I ended up uh, taking with me this mini recorder that recorded and digitally, that records digitally on a microphone, and I, I ended up taking it with me to Aruba, and I interviewed David Crosby over the phone in our, in our hotel room in Aruba. I edited the interview, on like a Friday morning on my laptop and then I sent it to the radio station and it aired the next morning as someone was filling in for me and while I listened to it on the beach 
<laughs> and Lorena said, best. that's how you're supposed to Absolutely. do radio. <laughs> you know, like you say, you know a little about a, a lot of things, but actually nobody I know knows more about pop culture than you do. I mean, you really, I, I thought I knew a lot, but you, you know way more. And the, the interesting thing is that you have interviewed some of the most amazing Musicians, particularly, yeah. who stands out? I mean, you mentioned David Crosby, but uh, I mean, over the years, he... and they like you. <laughs> you know, I, I know, I do know a lot about pop culture, but conversely, I've forgotten so much now as uh, time moves on about pop culture. You can't well, you're retiring. Can... You know, yeah, it's understandable. Um, you know, back to working on on Green Avenue, we were spoiled. Yeah, yeah everybody came in at the Montreal Forum. Every artist came in. Every yeah. artist would walk the two blocks. The record reps would uh, ask them after their sound check, do you want to do a little radio? Sure. And they'd walk over. So everyone walked through our doors, uh, which was just such a treat. But, uh, I mean... Uh, so who stands out? Uh, stands out. I mean, the guys from Tears for Fears came in the studio. Uh, bon Jovi came in the studio. Uh, Robbie Robertson came in the studio. Uh, Every band that was touring in the 1990s came to the studio. Melissa Etheridge sang a couple of songs uh, in the studio. I did a, I did a whole hour with Melissa on the, uh, the she, her concert. I think might have been the last concert at the Forum, if I'm not mistaken, going back to 1995. And so she did a whole hour with me after her sound check as we we were set up. You know how the uh, outside the Forum there were the, um, they had the um, on the main floor they had the escalators, right? Going right. Up, and they looked like hockey sticks, yeah. right, from outside. So we were set up there for the. Uh, for an hour and did uh, live broadcasts on the final day. And just everyone, Aerosmith. Uh, so we have to wrap up. I want to know, people will want to know now. Uh, you're retired. What are you going to be doing? What's the plan? Because obviously if you spend this much time thinking about whether you should retire or not, you must have a plan in place as to what you want to do. We're going to travel a lot more uh, instead of uh, being a slave to the radio schedule where you can only go here, you can yeah. only go there, as you well know, uh, in terms of time. But yeah, we're going to, we have trips planned to Portugal, uh, Argentina, uh, we've been going out to uh, Palm Springs, California for the last uh, 20 years because we have family out in California and so we love it there. So we're going to spend this time in the entire month of November in Palm Springs. Wow. Uh, and that's a, we go there usually twice a year, so it'll just be for longer stays. I'm going to uh, spend a lot of time this summer working on my golf game and looking for my ball in the woods. Work, yeah. <laughs> so no crying for Ken in Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, so yeah, so a lot of travel and uh, not getting up uh, at 3.30 anymore on uh, Saturday and Sunday mornings. But you know what? Yeah. People can listen. Uh, this will be the first weekend that you won't be on in 40 years or so. So uh, this might be the last time people hear you. So do you have something to say to all your listeners who by mistake think you're still on? Um, uh, just a big thank you. I mean, uh, I'm sure Aaron will attest to this too. I mean, getting to work on the air and do radio and something you love in your hometown, it's so rewarding and gratifying. And, you know, if you uh, listen to any of my shows over the years and let me keep you company, thank you so much. It's much appreciated. It was, uh, it was a privilege. It's a privilege and an honor to be on the air here in Montreal, and uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. It's a privilege working. Here. Absolutely. I think I can say for all Montrealers, thank you for you having been there as well for them. Thank you. Ken, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks. That's going to wrap up another edition yeah. of the Corner Booth yeah. Podcast. We'll see you again here from the Snowden Deli soon. <laughs>